Seba. So I'm going to let her go ahead and introduce herself because she knows about her credentials way more than I do. And um, I was really lucky that somebody approached me about her book. Um, we do also have her book. It's called Second Nature. Um, you can also buy it um, locally and wherever books are sold. So <laughs> I'll go ahead and turn it over to Erin now. Okay. Thanks, Haley. So um, I'm so glad that you guys came today. I know that it is a very stressful time. And as you're, you're hearing me say, it's for me as well. And to kind of be open to accepting new information at a time like this, when I feel like we're already kind of either overloaded or in isolation such that things are just strange. Um, I, I, that's amazing that you guys are able to feel like growing in that way today. So I really appreciate you guys being here. Um, and specifically kind of thinking about how we can parent in a really kind of deliberate and mindful way during these times when we have kids kind of that are in our face all the time, it can be a lot harder to do that. Um, and also a lot more important to take some of these principles that we are trying to instill in our kids and own them for ourselves so that we kind of have this balanced relationship with, with our kids. Um, and, you know, so I, I am a professor at UVA in the, in the psychology department. Um, but my background is more um, biology, so my research has been kind of on fetal alcohol syndrome and neurodegenerative diseases using um, kind of animal models, but also using um, neurons in a dish. All right, so this is the title of the book that I ended up writing. So Second Nature, How Parents Can Use Neuroscience to Help Kids Develop Empathy, Creativity, and Self-Control. And I didn't intend to set out to write a book in, in any way. I just realized as I kind of had my first son, so he's 16 now, this was when I was in graduate school and I was doing stuff in a lab every day, trying to figure out how neurons connected together and how we could kind of modify that. And I was kind of keeping it separate. So work was over here and kind of I went, went, I went home and I mean, granted, I did take him like two labs sometimes strapped like on my back if I had to go in on a Saturday and pipette something, but they were really separate things to me. And then, you know, we ended up trying to um, figure out, you know, how to do the best for him to make him the most successful. I spent a lot of time on this. I remember going, you know, I would take him in to Charlottesville every day because we lived further south in Scottsville at the time. And I would print out these little black and white pictures of numbers and letters. And so in his little rear facing um, car seat, he would be staring at the letter K or something that's giant and black and white because I knew that babies couldn't see colors that early. And I look back at that and I just, I, I can't believe like, what was I doing? I, I was so worried that he was gonna like miss out on something during that 20 minutes in the car that I was doing this, these letters have no significance to him whatsoever. So, you know, kind of as he went into kindergarten and kind of started going up through the elementary school years, um, it wasn't until maybe his sister came that we realized that they weren't getting any kind of socio-emotional learning at all in, in the school system that they were doing. And in actually contrast to this, the teachers were saying, you know, well, she's not doing really well in math or he's not doing great in spelling, but he's so kind or she's so you know pleasant to be around and we can't teach that kind of thing. And I started to, to think, well, I, I do feel like you can teach that. I feel like that's what I do every day at home. Um, and so I started to kind of put the two things that I did in the lab and at home together and to try to think about what can we teach our kids and how can we teach our kids that's more than just math or more than just like a spelling song. And then how can you take the principles of synaptic plasticity or knowing what, you know, the scientists know about how neurons connect together and kind of put that together so that you actually are, are, are cultivating a child or, or cultivating a brain because that, that's really what we're doing when we're parenting is we are kind of the guide here for a river that's flowing and you're trying to get it to the ocean without any major catastrophes happening. And, and I do feel like they, they are born with this kind of force of nature, that they are who they are, but there's also a lot of modifications that happen along this process that are experience-based and and we're really well placed to be able to put certain things in their experience so that they kind of are required to go through them. And by doing this, this is a way to really kind of actively change the way that the neuro, the neural architecture of the brain is in really long lasting ways that can be permanent. So 
that's a lot of re weighty responsibility. So as I was kind of thinking about the way that, you know, we think about success. So we want our kids to be successful. We want them to make the world a better place. So this idea of like, we want them to be kind and to, to do good, but we also really want them to be happy. These were the things that were most important to me, like more important than getting into a good school or, or getting a certain grade. Because my experience in higher ed has, has shown me that the grades don't matter as much as the way that you approach the class. And that I feel like you can do the just as, as like high level thinking and learning at a small liberal arts institution as you can at an Ivy League school. It's, it's more about what you do with the opportunities that, that you're given, how much you get out of it. So I started trying to think about this roadmap idea. So how can we get to these things? So to get to the compassion and get to the happiness and get to the success. Um, and so what I realized is that the literature shows us pretty clearly that there are these things that they go in and they ask successful people, you know, what do they have it or do they not have it? Um, and self-control is one of the ones that kept popping up again and again. If you look closely at self-control, um, it kind of has a whole bunch of subcategories in it. And, and what is self-control versus what is obedience? And it's, it's a pretty complicated thing. Um, again, empathy, people who were able to be empathetic and to act in kind ways towards others were, were happier. And then creativity kind of came in there as well. And the literature is showing that these things are important. And it was interesting because they're also all interconnected in ways that I never saw before. And so that's, that's pretty, so the book is basically written about these three skills and how they're interconnected and, and how we can foster that interconnectivity um, between the three of them. So each of these turns out to be, to be teachable in ways that I didn't know. So I didn't really know when I started doing this research that you could teach creativity. Um, I, I think that a lot of us have the attitude, I certainly did, that you know kids come in really creative and then we kind of like grind their creativity out of them by their schooling and the, the being rigid and not letting them kind of explore their own way of doing things. Um, and you know, if you've ever been a teacher in a, a, a grade school classroom with 30 kids in it, you can see pretty quickly why creativity is not gonna be the most prized thing there. You know, it becomes more about classroom management. It's really hard to let everybody do their own thing. Like at some point people have to re like reel themselves in and, and follow the rules. So there turns out to be kind of two different creative um, subcategories. So one is more like self-expression, which is shown with, you know, just like this drawing um, where you kind of are, it's, it's knowing yourself and it's more of like an Eastern kind of idea about self-fulfillment or self-actualization. And then the other one with the light bulb here is kind of this more Western idea of usefulness and purpose and coming up with better ways to do things like idea driven. Um, but it, it's interesting in the Western culture, it has to not only be a novel idea, but it has to be really effective. So it has to not just be different, but be useful in some way to solve a problem. So um, those two things then are teachable. Um, and the book kind of goes into a bunch of tools and how to do that. So empathy too can be broken down into two things. So empathy can be um, something that we feel. So feeling empathy um, or emotional empathy is when we literally feel a emotion in our, in our gut in response to a situation or someone else's plight. This is something that you can't really teach. So emotions are gut responses that are regulated by your own brain, not by outside forces. You, you can't ever make somebody feel an emotion. However, on the other kind of, of empathy, this is more thinking or cognitive empathy. And this is something that you can teach and that practice actually makes you get better at. So the idea of how somebody else is thinking, feeling, what they're gonna do based on past um, like scenarios, being able to predict someone else's behavior, their emotions in response to situations is definitely teachable. And I think this emotional empathy and the cognitive empathy together 
both of those have the ability to make people act or to be compassionate, kind of as, as we would call it, as our society would call it. And so this idea of teaching compassion is something that parents can do as well. So if you just feel really bad because somebody is hurting, that is a kind of empathy, but it's not really very helpful to our society or really to that person. So if your child is really emotionally empathetic, it doesn't really help them in their life. The thinking one as well, if you just have the ability to know what somebody is doing, that might help you be able to predict other people's behaviors. But if you don't do anything about the situation, then that doesn't really um, help in terms of a, having a compassionate world either. But if you can go the next step after that, so either you feel something or you think something and that spurs you to action, that's when, that's kind of like the holy grail of parenting where you're able to actually make compassionate acts a part of your kid's daily life. And the cool thing about compassionate acts is that they're really rewarding. So being nice to somebody is really rewarding. Giving to people is extremely rewarding in ways that like parents don't even have to be involved in that. If they just set up these opportunities for somebody to give rather than force them to share, that itself is something that will be rewarding. They know that they did it and that it felt good and they'll be more likely to do it again. So this self-control one is one that I think we've probably spent most of our time as parents working on, fostering self-control in our kids. So this idea of this marshmallow task. So I'm sure all you guys have heard about this really classic study that was done with marshmallows where they brought kids in and they put the marshmallow um, kind of in front of them and they said, you can have this marshmallow now. Or if you want to wait, you know, a certain amount of minutes, like 10 minutes, then you could have two marshmallows at the end. And so they kind of just looked to see which kids were the ones that ate the marshmallow right away and didn't wait versus which kids did not. And they, and they did a study where they followed a thousand kids through their lives and looked at their life outcomes and they found that the ones that were able to wait for the marshmallow had more kind of successful life outcomes based on like job and occupation and how much money that they made and if they were in jail or not. Um, and so this, this study, I've thought so much about this study because I really feel like this study isn't testing self-control at all. I feel like it's, it's testing how much they trust the researcher, if he's actually going to give them the marshmallow or not, is it a trick? So it really taps into, you know, how you feel about authority figures. Um, and I'll, it's obedience, really. It, are, is, is this child going to do what somebody tells them to do, particularly if they're not, if they're a stranger to them? And so thinking about this idea of self-control, I realized that I wouldn't really care if my child failed the marshmallow test because I really want them to be a, a thoughtful person that makes their own decisions. And so I personally realized that I wouldn't mind if they went ahead and ate the marshmallow if something felt off about that situation to them. And so thinking about this, I realized that it's not self-control so much that we need our kids to have, but self-regulation. So the difference between self-control and regulation here, it becomes kind of, can I get to a goal that I have and do it without hurting other people? And if there's a rule there that says that I can't do X, can I figure out a way to get what I want while still adhering to the rule and not hurting anybody else? And this is more self-regulation. And this skill comes kind of into play with all of these. So if we're saying we want our kids to have good self-regulation, they're able to basically be in control of themselves while still working towards getting what they want in life, you've got to have empathy because you've got to be able to see how your actions impact somebody else. You've got to have self-control because you can't just do anything that comes your way. You have to be strategic about what's worth it and what's not worth it. And then you got to be creative. So if there is a rule there that there's a roadblock, um, you got to figure out a way to kind of get around it while still not crushing anybody else's hopes and dreams on your way to your own. So self-regulation is this, is this really what we're working towards as parents and people call it lots of different kinds of things. Um, but, but self-regulation is the skill that all three of these things will build if you're able to kind of cultivate those in your kids. So the cool thing is that they're all teachable skills. How to teach them can be a little bit more like boots on the ground. 
it's hard to know in a daily situation how to best foster these. But what's really nice about it is if you understand the way that the neurons connect together in these really complex circuits, you can kind of make sure that each day you're practicing one of these skills in a really small way and it's enough. So you can spend two, five minutes, something like that on one skill each day and you can kind of weave it into your daily activity with your kids so that it doesn't seem like a big deal on top of it. Like when we do this in, in my family, we never really use the words empathy. We never use the words creativity really. Um, we certainly don't use the word self-control. These are these big ethereal concepts that I don't expect kids to really have a grasp of, but the, the little components of them. So am I able to be who I'd like to be if it doesn't impact other people negatively? This is an idea of not just creativity, but it's also empathy together. So these concrete ideas, these mantras are, are kind of quotes that you can have for your family that have the right underlying principles rather than these really kind of concrete scientific categories. I, I wanna talk a little bit just about how the brain connects together. So this, this is a diagram that I made to just show there are three main stages of brain development. And one of them happens pretty much, <clears throat> or it does happen all the way during pregnancy. And it's just where the neurons are born and then they go to where they're supposed to be in the adult brain. And so this happens from the first couple of weeks of pregnancy, and then it continues all the way until the baby's born. And then the second thing that happens is the neurons have to connect together. So they're at their final resting place, but they need to connect with each other because our brain is pretty intricately connected. So this is synapses, is the connection between two neurons. And so synaptogenesis is the beginning or the forming of these synapses. And this starts kind of halfway through pregnancy and it goes on until here it's depicted as just before adolescence that it kind of cuts off with this, these giant enormous periods of massive uh, connect connections that are forming. And what's interesting is we start out as kids with far more connections than we will ever need. Far more neurons are born than we'll ever need. Far more synapses are formed than we'll ever need. And the way that we develop is just basically trimming them back. So becoming who we are is basically a weeding out process of what synapses are working well and we wanna keep versus the ones that are not being used and they're taking up space, taking up resources and we're gonna get rid of them. And so parenting with this idea in mind is I think really been pretty groundbreaking for me in terms of thinking about how my kid, like what my kid does in, in, a, in a day. So the experiences that they have during that day are going to strengthen those particular synapses. And the ones that they are not having during a day, that means those pathways are going to be kind of weakened. And so it's made me a lot more deliberate about having my kids be more balanced in what they experience. And if something's really important to me as a life skill, I'll try to throw a little bit in, you know, every day or every couple of days to make sure that it's something that's still in their experience. So that it's still shaping who they are. If I feel like it's something that they really need for overall life success. So that's synaptogenesis. And then I would say too that brain development never really stops. So there's not some magic period of, of three years old or five years old where you kind of, oh, now you're set in stone and we're just gonna have to deal with what we have. Like we're definitely still forming, our brains are still forming for myelination, which is the next stage. This goes until people are in their 30s um, where it's a more of a maturation process of the brain. And then even after 30s, we are constantly having our synapses be strengthened or weakened and rearranged in a more kind of lesser way, but it's still happening. And that's the whole way that we can learn things. So if you, if you repeat something every day for a week, you're gonna learn that French phrase or whatever it is that you're trying to learn. And that is literally because you're strengthening those synapses, the neurons are gonna be changing their gene expression to send more supplies to that connection point between the neurons so that it stays and it sticks around. So it's a really active dynamic process. Um, so, you know, I would say that we're undergoing brain development still until we die every day. If As long as we're able to learn something new, which we always are, we are always, we're always developing.
So let me go to this last stage, which is myelination. So myelination is this, the neurons have really long axons, which I'll show you a picture of in, in a minute. And the neurons axons is where the signal travels down and it can get speeded up if there's a little other cell that comes and wraps around the axon. And so that like coding is called myelination and it's able to speed it up because it acts like an insulator. And so it, it acts the same way like fiber optic cables or, or wires would work where it's, a, it's, it's able to um, insulate the electrical signal to make it move faster down the, um, th down the length of the wire basically. So, Myelination is something that starts in late pregnancy and it goes on until we said before, um, typically in the late 20s, early 30s. And the last regions that get myelinated or made faster are gonna be the ones up in the frontal lobe, which is the areas that are responsible for what we think of as mature behavior. So this is why you, know, you still have 18, 20 year olds who are making kind of dumb decisions sometimes and you're like, why? I don't even understand why you would get on top of that car and do donuts around that cul-de-sac, right? So this is because this is not fully formed yet. Okay, it's also one of the first places that alcohol seems to affect when you have a drink is the connections in the frontal cortex. So just saying that as well. So myelination um, is this third stage and it is important and it's so regulated that you can kind of look and um, and a an, uh, scan when a baby's in utero and you can tell kind of exactly the gestational age just based on the pattern of white that's there. So the myelin is white. So that's kind of neat as well because once something is used a lot, it's more likely to be myelinated and made faster. And once that um, kind of circuit or that pathway is myelinated, then you are very unlikely to lose that myelination. You'll typically keep it for the rest of your life unless you have some kind of like a demyelinating disorder, which most of us hopefully will not experience. So that's kind of the timeline that we're doing here. And, and I wanted to show you what these neurons look like. So I think the best example for what a neuron looks like is just like a tree. So the one on the right here is a neuron and it always sends information one way, one direction. So when this happens, you have electrical input come in from the top. That's kind of like the branches of the tree and the cell bodies up there. And then the information when it gets sent to another neuron travels down the axon, which is like the trunk. And then the roots kind of under the ground for the tree are gonna be what connect to the next neuron. So it always goes just in this one direction. It can't ever send information back up. So um, the information is electrical inside this neuron. And then what's really neat is it becomes a chemical. So at the very end of where the roots were in the tree, when it's about to send that message to the next one, the next neuron, the, the signal changes from being electrical to being chemical. This is really important because if it was electrical, it would just go right through and it would never stop and you would not have that much control over it. It would simply be an all or a none. But because we have this really cool way of turning it into a chemical at the little tiny space in between one neuron and the next neuron, we have so much more control over when and how much and what the response is on the next cell to that signal is. So this has like a one, two, three here. This has blown up the connection in between one neuron and the next. And you can see that the first neuron, it comes down and then the number one, it's got these little tiny, basically looks like balloons um, or pouches and they have neurotransmitter in them. So when it's a go signal from that neuron, it'll come and it'll dock right at the, at the very edge of that first neuron and it'll release all of those little baby neurotransmitter triangles into the next um, space between it and the next cell. And then it kind of just meanders around in there um, and diffuses until it might hit the next cell where there's a receptor for it. And if it's the right receptor, it'll bind in there. And that's number two. So when it binds to the next cell, that's a signal to the next cell. Hey, I'm getting a go signal. I probably should go, or it might be a stop signal. If it's a stop signal, then that next neuron knows it's supposed to stop and not fire. And then number three basically says, hey, something's gonna happen in that cell. So it either will make things happen in an action potential will be sent down that next neuron, or it will make it so that it's less likely to fire. And that is interesting because the second neuron, its job is to just integrate all of the signals it gets from all of the neurons. 
and it makes a judgment call based on all the kind of inhibitory signals coming in and all the ones that excite and it does a balancing act and if it's enough to go then it'll send the signal and if it's not then it won't it'll be quiet and that's really important the timing of these things becomes really important so okay we've got our brain we know it's electrical we know it's also chemical which is the way that we are able to kind of get in and use tools like drugs to be able to change neurotransmitter levels but there's so many things that we can do as parents that are not invasive not not, not have nothing to do with drugs there's so many tools that we can use if we just think about it from the idea that whatever fires together, wires together, so we're trying to make these circuits, okay? And if it doesn't link up, then it doesn't sync up. So this idea that if they're not kind of being repeated again and again, then we're going to lose that skill, all right? So this whole process of development is just a weeding out of who we're not going to become. For each one of these, like the book goes into a lot of detail about how we can do it. So modeling the qualities of empathy, self-control, and creativity. So this for me was really hard to try to put these kind of into play. So modeling creativity means I actually like am doing some creative stuff that I didn't feel like I had time for. But I realized that it's not enough for me just to set aside space like in the house or time in the day and force a kid to be bored and therefore hope that they're going to be creative. But I actually had to do it. And what's interesting is when I set myself up to like, you know, paint, which I haven't done in five years, but I decided to do it, you know, in this pandemic that we're having right now, when I went and painted and just decided to do it, they joined me. Like my kids saw me doing it and they were like, oh, that doesn't seem terrible. But if I sit my kids down and like spread all the things nicely out before them and then go try to do something else like the dishes, they're not going to paint. Like they're going to come and be right under my feet and bother me while I'm doing the dishes, to be honest. So it's not as effect it's not effective. So this idea of modeling the, the qualities, you know, again, with giving yourself a little bit of space. Certainly, I have put myself in timeout many times um, since I've written this book, realizing that that space is important for reflection for me as well. So I definitely will say, you know what, I need a minute. And then when I'm ready to deal, when I have the right amount of self-control, I'll, I'll come out and I'll say, okay, I'm ready to talk about it now. The exact same thing that I expect them to do when they're not in control of themselves. So the second thing is to kind of make decisions. So if you make decisions, there's a couple really cool things that happen. First, if you decide to do something, you're going to be more accountable for your actions. You're going to own what you did. There's research that says that you're more likely to take responsibility for the outcome of something if you decided to do it in the first place. Um, it also is one of these pathway things where if you practice making decisions, you get better at making decisions. And so this is important when you have all these things coming in from different um you know, pathways like the empathy pathways and the self-control pathways and the creativity pathways, and also thinking about, you know, what you want in terms of working towards a goal, or if, you know, you have grit or resilience, these things really complicated. And I think that this space here, that allowing your kids to make their own decisions is really important. Um, and, and not, you know, to say that you should allow, a, you know, a two-year-old to do whatever they want, but it has to have some structure to it. So a two-year-old, you know, could be able to choose this outfit or that outfit for the day, or they could choose, you know, hey, you have to do this. Do you want to do it before or after you do that? And as your kids get older, you give more and more of that control about making decisions to them. Because if you think about it, if you never let them make control, make decisions, and then you send them off to college, you know, they're going to be in my freshman level class and they're not going to be able to know how to solve problems or how to make their own decisions for themselves. And I've, I've seen it happen where you have these really competent um, students who are just flailing in life because they've not been able to make their own decisions. Someone's already, they, they, you know, we, we take our kids and we put them in school. Well, right, right now we don't, but typically we put them in school all day and then they're in extracurricular activities all afternoon and then evening we eat and then they have to do homework and then they go to bed and they've spent their entire day not making any decisions for themselves. Like they're being enriched, but they're not deciding anything. They have no control over this. And therefore the the idea about how to make good decisions isn't being practiced. They're, they're not being able to fail at making a bad decision and see how that feels. 
So putting as many opportunities as possible for your kids to make decisions um, in there is important. And then comes this idea of parental scaffolding. So scaffolding is this term that's taken um, really from biology. So the neuron has a ton of scaffolding in it. And, and what happens is there are these giant proteins that are in the neuron and they basically serve as a meeting place for lots of other proteins to come and attach to. It's the same thing when you're building a building. You have to have scaffolding up around it as you build it. And this is something that I do a lot with my kids because you can't just be super free range and expect there not to be consequences that are too big for them to handle. And you can't be helicopter all the time because then you end up having these kids that come to college and fail. There has to be something in the middle. And, and this idea of parental scaffolding is that middle ground. So this is the situation where you would, when a child's really young, you would say, well, you're in this social conflict. Hey, the options here are you could go and talk to them and tell them how you feel. You could um, try again. You could go back. What, you know, what examples do you have of how you could do something? So getting their involvement more and more as they get older is important. So we ended up having some pretty specific um, scaffolds that we use with the kids. So we have one that they use when they have done something they're not supposed to do and it hurts somebody else. And, and they have to basically use this thing called out. So out stands for the O is they have to own what they did. And then the U is they have to understand how it made somebody else feel. And then the T is you have to tell them what you're gonna do to make it not happen again. So this is if somebody is, you know, whack somebody on the head playing cards or something like that. This would be kind of what they would be doing if they had a timeout. They would be using that time to think about, okay, I need to own it. I need to say how it made them feel and I need to tell them how I won't do it again. So maybe they'd say, I would go and tell, you know, mom and say that I, we need some assistance here. She's saying she doesn't have the car, that's the two, but I know she does. Right, so we also have one um, for if somebody feels like they're being bullied at school. So this one is um, something that's like, it, it's called staff. So it's the same kind of thing, but it's like standing up for yourself. So you know, say that it's not okay, um, you know, or say how you feel about something and tell them that it's not okay. Ask for what you want to have happen. So those three things are basically standing up for yourself, letting them, letting them know what's going on, that this is not an okay thing to do. And specifically this asking for how, what you want to have happen is really important. Because as a, as a person that was never really taught conflict resolution skills, this has been really something that I use a lot now. Ask for what I want to have happen. And then the Fs are, you know, find another friend to play with if you're on the playground and it's not going well, or find an adult to, it could be, you know, just somebody else that some things are, are really too big to be handled by kids if there's actually physical, you know, abuse or ongoing um, emotional targeting. So these kinds of ideas about scaffolding where when they're young, you kind of give them a couple of ideas and they can choose here is important. And then as they get older, you know, I might say, look, that was handled really poorly, 14 year old. What are three ways you could have done that instead? And then they, they know they can come up with different things and thinking about it and visualizing a different outcome is almost just as good as actually doing the right thing because you're making them think through that pathway. And so if you think about it, if you're lost in the middle of Crozet somewhere and you haven't been there before, if you can visualize how to get home, all right, and think about how you would follow that pathway, the next time you're dumped there again, you're gonna remember, oh, last time I was here, I was dumped here, I didn't know where I was and I could visualize the path home, so I'll just take that path home. It becomes the path that they're most likely to take, the path of least resistance if you keep practicing it. So this idea of mindfulness and reflection is really important because when something's not going wrong, we need to allow our kids space to pivot. And for us as well, we need to allow us to have deliberate, kind of parenting skills. Because when I parent reactionary, it, it is not good. Like I need to parent in a way where I'm mindful of where I'm going and the skills that are important in that particular moment. So the idea of timeouts for myself, this is something that I, I do. The idea of timeouts for them, I do, but it is something where I just um, ask them to not come out of the timeout until they're ready to have this conversation about feelings 
and how they could do it differently. I think it's really important too to not get involved all the time. When there are sibling conflicts, um, I often take a step back and, and I kind of try to let them work it out. Like I won't force them to share. I just, you know, I present the opportunity to them. And then, you know, if somebody doesn't get in and grab half of what they have and give it to the other person, then it's a lot more meaningful if they sit there and they they sit with the the way that it feels to not share. And they sit there with the way that it feels to have a sibling crying. Nobody comes in and rescues them. Eventually, um, the best case scenario is that they're going to share because that relieves that bad feeling that they have and then they feel better about it afterwards. So this idea of these quiet spaces are really important as well. Um, and then this idea of the, la the right kind of practice. So this doesn't mean that people are able to just kind of act however they want. If you have this space and somebody does the wrong thing and it makes it worse, then you've got to get back in there and you've got to say, hey, that didn't really go very well. Let's talk about why or let's talk about maybe what you could do differently next time. And the, the key here is that being kind and being good to others is actually really rewarding. It feels good. Um, and people who can do it, it, it find that it is can be a little bit addictive be able to do that for other people. Um, this taps into synaptic plasticity. So when you're doing the right kind of practice, this is actually changing synapses. So when you have two little synapses next to each other, and if one is being used, like the lightning bolts are showing, and the other one's not, then the one that's being used is going to be strengthened, and it might even turn into two synapses to support all that activity coming into the cell. And eventually when it's not used, the first synapse is going to wither away. And so this is the way that our experiences change the way that we are as people. And this is a picture that I took in my lab of a neuron's dendrite. So this is one of the projections coming out from a neuron. And this is what these little tiny spines look like in real life. So the spines are typically where you have the connections happen between the neurons and they're out there in the dendrites ready to receive information and they're really plastic. So they can come and go under a microscope um, in a matter of minutes. And, and, and that's really cool because it means that things can change quickly and that things can change in some ways in a permanent way. So if you keep using these pathways again and again, it'll support the, the development of these more mature spines. So all the little white arrows here are pointing to spines that are on this neuron um, on, one of the, on one of the projections. So this kind of goes to show you, then this is like a summary slide, that the um, neurotransmitter that's released between the two neurons has the capability to make synaptic plasticity happen more or less based on the amount of neurotransmitter that's activating that next neuron. It can lead to changes in genes because it allows you to not change your actual genetic structure, but change which genes are turned on or turned off in order to support these and make these pathways um, stronger. And then overall allow us to experience these things that are really complex, but can be broken down into kind of more tiny pieces so that we can actually foster these skills that before I did this research, I didn't really realize that they were teachable skills. So it actually made me really happy that they were teachable because it felt all of a sudden like, um, I had a purpose that I didn't have before in parenting because it's all of a sudden it wasn't just about getting a kid who had A, B average and could get into whatever schools they want. But all of a sudden it, I realized that if, the, if the, the kids aren't getting this in school, that it's my responsibility to teach them this at home or they're not going to get it. And so instead of practicing only multiplication tables at home, you know, we're trying to do things that are more like, uh, you know, how, reading a book at home at night and pausing, you know, during the conflict and saying, oh, how would you feel if that happened to you? And just waiting like up to 30 seconds to see what they, what they say. And just that one daily thing, that pause that allows them to really think, oh, how would I feel? How does little bear feel? Whoever it is in your book, this is enough. This one tiny two minute thing is enough to cultivate these skills in your child. You're, you're cultivating empathy. You're cultivating self-control because you're making them wait a little bit in the middle of the story and you're cultivating creativity if you then ask them what would you do if you were little bear and lost your mom so this is a really simple way to just take an activity that you do every day with your kids and transform it into a, a, a teaching tool for these three really important 
skills. So the, the book there is as, as well, um, the Second Nature book, and it's on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and at the library. And I think it's at Over the Moon um, bookstore. And this picture is here is just to show you that I've come to think about my, my role as a parent, a neuroscientist, a neuroscientist parent, yes, but my role as a parent as being simply to put the focus on what I feel like is most important and to let the other things blur out. And I do that especially for things I know they're gonna get anyway. So especially for things I know they're gonna get during a regular school day, my focus when they're here with me is gonna be on the things that I think that they're not getting, that I think are important to success and to happiness. So maybe if you guys have any questions, we can do questions. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I actually have an almost two-year-old at home, so like this is also really awesome for me to hear um, everything. And I actually have your book <laughs> in hand. Um, so I had checked it out so we could prepare for a program when it was going to happen in, in physical form. Um, so I've been reading it, and it's been really great. Although with the two-year-old, I don't have as much time to read. <laughs> Even with the yes. said, like, there is an audible um, book so it is on on an audiobook if it, it's on audible yeah so if you yeah. want to listen to me for several hours talking i'm that. the reader so you're you can do that through I audible that. and um, it's kindle and I'm too going to share um aaron had shared with me um a great article on empathy especially during the quarantine and um what that looks like and i'm going to just share the link to her psychology today uh um, articles. I also read through the one on reading to your kids and like you said, stopping and, and talking about like the conflict. Um, and that was super awesome because I was like, oh yeah, that totally makes sense. Um, so without further ado, let's just go ahead and open it up to questions. If you have a question, um, you can type it in a chat box. Well, I was going to ask you, um, do you think that in some ways this like quarantine has can be helpful in helping kids practice empathy. Like parents are probably spending a lot more time around their kids. Um, do you think, I mean, I guess it can go either way, whether or not a, a parent is actually promoting those things or if a kid has enough self-control to kind of do some of that on their own. Oh, I but definitely think so. There is a lot of self-scheduling. Yeah, I definitely think this is an amazing time for parents to be able to do these things because one of the things I talk about a lot in the book is allowing kids to control their schedule as much as makes sense to do. So um, especially when you have older kids saying, you know, you can have X amount of time on the screen and you schedule it and, and tell me what your schedule looks like and then we both agree to it. That is so important now because like, especially with me as four, I'm doing that with all of them saying, these are the things you need to get done. These are what the parameters I'm comfortable with. Come to me with your schedule. And as long as it doesn't impact anyone else negatively, we're doing that. So these ideas of like coming up with your own parameters within guidelines are super important for these self-regulation skills. And, and what you want to have is a situation where a kid does a little bit more of this every year until they hit 18. And then for the most part, they should be scheduling themselves, getting all their stuff done in a best case scenario without impacting you as the parent negatively. I mean, that would be ideal. It doesn't happen that way, right? A lot, a lot of the times. But I, I think if you start when they're really little, then it helps. So, you know, we, we also agree on consequences ahead of time so that when that happens, you take a lot of that reactionaryness out of being a parent. So like when my son was um, in middle school, we would say we're comfortable with this amount of um, gaming time and we're comfortable with this grade point average. And within those, come up with your schedule. You also need to do your chores. And so he would do it and we would agree, you know, that, that there were also rules like that he can't have his stuff in his room, his, his gaming stuff in his room. And he had to do his chores first. And he had to like do it when he said he was going to do the gaming time. And if he didn't do it, there were consequences that were already established and he made them up. So he'd say, okay, the first time I don't do this, I'll lose it for a day, the next time a week, the next time a month, the next time you can sell it on eBay. So when he did this, this was far more stringent than I would have done. But because he was the one that made the rule, he actually followed the rule, you know? And in this particular case, 
this was several years ago, we ended up selling this like Pokemon DS or whatever it was at the time on eBay because he did four times in a row. But you know what? He was like, man, right? Because he was the one that chose that. Like I never, there's so much, they're so much more stringent than I would be when they make up their own consequences. But this is this idea of this, the ownership of it. He, I, you know, I can just feel like what's going to happen now. And he'll be like, oh man. Right. So like, he he knows so it takes some of the burden of being like the jail keeper off me how do you determine if something is too big to let them deal with alone it's subjective so, yeah so for this i um for the most part if it if it went really poorly i always step in afterwards because i don't feel like the, the this experience should happen without guidance some of it also to me depends on how old they are so if they're in elementary school and, and um early middle school i still have been I, I will i will step in before someone gets hurt like literally hurt if someone's feelings are hurt that's different so i feel like for me as a parent you know that i will kind of it's not okay to have physical hurting <laughs> at all um and but like this is things like sharing or things that technically there's no law that says that you have to do it. These are just choices that our kids are making. So for the most part, I'll let those kind of go and then we'll talk about it afterwards. And, and a lot of time what I've realized is that when something like that is happening, that it's not going the way that I want, but um, it's already over. And I can come in, I can talk about it, but sometimes just changing the power balance can do a lot. So like if you have a, a an older brother who's kind of overbearing and you have a littler sister who always gets left out in a mean way, sometimes it's enough to just kind of let the older brother kind of be exclusionary, which isn't nice. I'm not gonna make him play with her. But then, you know, they all come to eat lunch and I might let the two-year-old dole out the dessert. And she is generous and kind because she's two and she doesn't care and she'll give cookies. And then all of a sudden he's like, oh, hey, you know, he's flipped things, right? And so this power differential is always there in every situation. And so part of what I do just as a parent of multiple kids is make sure that the power is not always against one or two kids and that it doesn't always um, end up with the older kids having all the power because I feel like it's really important for development to have an, this being the underdog as well. So it's not great for my oldest to always grow up being the best at everything, the first at everything. And so I do a lot of flipping there as well. So I'll often invert who goes first on something, you know, and, and try to change what I can in terms of the power there. So I would say, um, I try to let them do it themselves. If I feel like it's going to be lasting harm that lasts more than an hour, you know, in terms of the dynamics of the family, then I'll step in. And the older they are, the less I step in. And the more I say things when it's inappropriate, I'll say, that's not okay. That's not acceptable in our family. Do it a different way. So I will get involved if I feel like there's going to be damage to, to somebody else's self-esteem or somebody else's physical person. Um, what's this other question? So how do we as parents continue to foster social emotional learning and promote strong interpersonal skills when children are practicing social distancing from others? So this is one of the, the places where the scaffolding becomes really important. So the scaffolding is, is nice because it can happen in the absence of other people. So if you have an only kid, this would happen at home, hopefully with you as well. Like you're not going to be able to get in there and modulate their interactions with another sibling. And so, yeah, you might be able to do it on the playground or during play dates, but really what's important here is talking through these situations in the absence of when they're happening. So if something happened at school and you come home and you have a situation where Delaney is giving people rides and pretending she's the boss on the playground and won't give your kid a ride because she says she's too heavy, even though she weighs like 50 pounds, this is a, a bullying issue that you can talk through at home. You're never going to be in a situation where you're going to sit down with Delaney and your kid and talk it out. But you can tell your child, you can say, okay, this, this is the staff acronym. You need to do this, 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 and this. If you don't feel comfortable doing this, what are your other options? And kind of explore this, like choose your own adventure for her options so that she feels empowered. 
And I think it's really important too in those situations to really empathize with the bully. So why would this person be doing this? What is going on in their life? Like sometimes we spin these really elaborate things when people do rude, awful things to us. Like there was um, my um, son was in a car going down 29 next to Lowe's and there was like a interaction on a traffic light where somebody got mad and thought that our car had cut them off and she was eating a Big Mac and she threw it in our car. Like hit my son on the face with this Big Mac on 29. And like, what do you even do with that, right? So like, I'm not gonna, you know, you're not gonna drive them down on your car and honk at them. Like this is this amazing opportunity to model. What do you do here? Right. And so we ended up spinning this whole story about this woman. Like, obviously, that's not OK. Who does this? This lady had kids in the back of her own car. And so we, we had this thing like, what does she do for her job? Why is she so mad this morning? What did she get for Christmas last year? Like, how what was her childhood like? What's her dog look like? What does she name it? Does she put it in a little outfit? Is it the thing she loves because she doesn't feel loved? Like this whole like thing. So we're just using our creative like spirit to try to empathize with this person in a time when really that just sucked. Like that, that was just an awful experience with humanity. And you know, my kids, they're looking at me to see how am I going to frame that? How am I going to do that? You know, and these are things like you can do with movies. If you have a, a movie similar to watching or reading a book, you can stop. You can say, ah, oh, I'm going to go get popcorn. Like, it doesn't have to be overt, like, okay, 14-year-old, I'm going to pause this right now. We're going to talk about this. No, you just be like, ah, oh, I've got to pee so bad. Just, I've got to pause it. You can go and be like, I can't believe she's getting back together with him. Like, he's obviously so mean to her. Like, these ideas of, like, what do you think she's thinking? And and these these ideas about taking things that lead us through the story. So things like a movie, things like a TV, and turning them into interactive experiences, it's really important to be able to do that. And I think that the pandemic in some way heightens our ability to do this with our kids because we have more face time to do it with. Like there's all these things about, you know, what's happening in our neighborhoods and who's helping and who's not helping. And what is that like? Like, can you understand why someone wouldn't be able to help right now? Like people are overwhelmed. They don't have extra resources. Can you understand the motivation behind why someone would? And like, what are the rules around it right now? These discussions are really important to have, particularly now um, in, the, in the pandemic, in the absence of the social interaction. So I guess I would say you can certainly use a social interaction in the past to scaffold now and to work through anything that happened in your kid's school year already. And also how you're gonna kind of re-engage with people. The, the unknown is scary. And I think having parental scaffolding on that, what we're gonna do if there's this outcome, what we're gonna do if schools are still closed in the fall, what we're gonna do if this, and you know, we don't know the answers to this stuff. And so there's no reason that we can't talk about it with our kids just because we don't know the right answers. A lot of times I have no idea what the right answer is in this, this kind of vulnerability with our kids is really important if we expect them to be vulnerable with us. Like just idea generation in terms of creativity is so vulnerable. Like you don't want to put an idea out there that's stupid. Like this idea of, of not wanting to fail and not wanting our kids to fail. This is something that we need to throw out the window. Like we should embrace our kids failing, but they need to be able to fail in order. Like you don't want them to be excellent at the first thing they do. Because if they do that, they're not stretching themselves, they're not growing, they're not exploring better ways to do things. You, you want them to be able to fail and to figure it out. And, and that's the way you're going to leave your fullest life that you possibly can lead. It's hard. Hang in there, guys. I guess that's, you know, it's, it's difficult for all of us. It's difficult for single parents. It's difficult for co-parents. It's difficult for peer, parents who've been married for 50 years and can't see their grandkids and come up to the window like... The rules are completely being remade right now. So this idea of being adaptable and being resilient and just getting up every day and doing it again, just this idea of being a good model for your kids right now, be empathetic even when you feel like you can't do it one more second and take timeouts if you need timeouts. Just go lock yourself in the bathroom, put your child in a safe place and lock yourself 
somewhere for five minutes to get a reset so that you can parent the way that you want to be parenting instead of reacting to the pandemic because it's really easy to do. It's really easy to react to the weight of not knowing and of being sequestered. It's hard. So hang in there. We're all, we're all in here. <laughs> I just want to listen to you talk about parenting for like another hour, especially addressing all of these issues that we're dealing with at home right now. Um, like this was a good idea. This presentation was a good idea before all of this happened. And now that it's happened, I feel like it's even more essential um, that people know this kind of stuff because it is absolutely um yeah, it's just, it's hard to know exactly what to do. And it's always hard to know exactly what to do. But I feel like um, you're also good at saying like, you don't have to, like you're learning how to do this too. And that's great to be here too. <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca's notes funny. <laughs> yeah. She said, I took a whole page of notes while my five-year-old dumped on me. That's perfect. That's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's lovely. Um, and you, so I have a website too. So if you have any other questions, you can contact me through the website and I'm happy to, you know, just interact. And I do have the Psychology Today blog. So I'll be putting up more, hopefully, resources. And um, I just finished doing a whole um, series of videos that I'm going to try to put out in the next week or two. That is, so I teach neural basis of behavior at UVA. So um, what I did is as I went through this semester, did five minutes for parents after each lecture. So if you are interested in more about neuroscience, those will be up um, on YouTube um, soon. And so if you ever have five minutes and want to learn about this system or that system, you're welcome to watch those videos. That's gonna be on your website? Yeah, I'll put the links on my website um, um, and they'll be on YouTube. So you can probably search it on YouTube as well. Just by searching your name? Yeah. Yeah, they're not up yet, but I'll, they'll be up within a week because today is my last day of classes in terms of lecture at UVA. So that means that we'll have, there'll be 30, 31 of them. So it'll be basically, if you did one a day for a month, you will have, you'll know everything that you would have if you took that class at UVA. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> um, this has been super fascinating. It's been awesome to hear from you. So thank you so, so much. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I agree with the clap emoji. Let's see. <laughs> there we go. Yay. Thank you, guys. Hang in there. Yeah, Marin. Hang in there. And I really appreciate you letting me have the opportunity to come. And also, all of you, because I know that it is hard, hard, hard to take time at a very specific time of day to um, sit here for an hour and, and talk about things that are, are big picture things. So um, good luck to all of you. And I hope that I will see you face to face soon. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Erin. Right, bye bye. Bye.